Great, good to see you all. And uh, I think there are some people on Zoom. We're trying to do this uh, hybrid approach. Uh, so I'm mic'd and I think if I'm standing here, they can see me. Otherwise, if I step away, they probably can't because the camera's on my laptop. Uh, but hopefully they can see the screen and uh, hear what I'm saying. Um, so I wanna just tell you a little bit about what this talk, where this talk came from. Um, I have uh, for the last year or so, uh, been writing some articles for Quanta Magazine, which is an online science publication. Um, and they asked me if I could write some articles about the history of math. Um, and last spring, I pitched to them the idea of writing an article about dimension, and they said yes. And so in the spring, I started uh, looking at the history of dimension. I knew some of it already, uh, but it was a rabbit hole that I went down that I really, really enjoyed. Um, and there's more than one article's worth of material and more than one talk's worth of material uh, to share with you. So um, I have, I guess I've already lost five minutes here. Uh, I have a lot to say. I, I'm gonna try to keep going. If you guys have questions, uh, let me know. Uh, and if you wanna see the article, it was published not too long ago. You can just Google my name and Dimension or Quantum Magazine or something and you can find it. So if we're talking about Dimension, this is probably something that you are relatively familiar with, at least in some sort of abstract way. Um, so you can imagine this uh, hawk sitting at the top of a flagpole, um, experiencing zero dimensions. Um, these crows sitting on a telephone wire, experiencing one dimension. Uh, this ostrich, which is free to roam in two dimensions along the ground. And this eagle, which can take advantage of all three dimensions in air. Um, this is probably not anything too surprising for you. Um, and in fact, uh, scholars have been thinking about dimensions for many, many years. Uh, we could go back as far as Aristotle. Um, he wrote, of magnitude, that which extends one way as a line, that which extends two ways as a plane, and that which extends three ways as a body. And there are no magnitudes besides these because the dimensions are all there are. And thrice extended means extended all ways. Uh, a little later, uh, Euclid wrote the elements around 300 BCE, uh, and he defined a point as that which hath no part, a line is a breadthless length, a surface is that which has length and breadth only, and a solid uh, is that which has length, breadth, and depth. So, you know, as far as 2,500 years ago, people had the idea of dimension. Um, however, having said that, uh, those aren't really definitions and it's hard to make sense of, you know, if we were really to pin you down on what is a dimension, uh, that's sort of a hard question. And if we jump ahead to the uh, early 19th century, uh, Bolzano wrote, at the present time, there's still lacking a precise definition of the most important concepts, line, surface, and solid. So even by the beginning of the 19th century, there was not a really rigorous definition of what dimension meant. Um, so, what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to talk about the history of the concept of dimension. Uh, I'm going to talk about sort of the public's view of dimension. I'll have uh, a little detour to talk about the fourth dimension, which is interesting. Uh, and we're going to talk about how mathematicians finally did define dimension and, and show that it was really a mathematical thing. And then lastly, I'm going to talk about high dimensional spaces, which is a topic that's Im really important uh, right now. Um, but for now, we'll just say that, uh, you know, that we can sort of recognize what a dimension is. Uh, this even entered a Supreme Court case once. Uh, Justice Potter Stewart said, uh, I shall not attempt further to define the kinds of material I understand to be embraced within that shorthand description dimension. And perhaps I could never succeed in intelligibly doing so, but I know it when I see it. Okay, for those of you who know this quote, this was not actually about dimension. This was about a certain type of obscenity. I know it when I see it. But I would say this is <clears throat> what most people think of <clears throat> when they think of dimension. You know, I know it when I see it. I know one dimension, I know two dimensions, three dimensions, et cetera. Okay, um, so let's just for fun, let's take a detour and talk about the fourth dimension. Um, and so here we're thinking about a fourth physical dimension. So one dimension, two dimensions, three dimensions, and then somehow a fourth dimension that is somehow perpendicular to our three dimensions. Um, and so this is something that mathematicians uh, have thought about for many years. 
And there's a variety of ways that, um, that we try to imagine what a fourth dimension might be. Uh, so one method would be from projections. So just to illustrate, um, this is an example of a three-dimensional cube being projected down onto a two-dimensional plane, right? So it's like the shadow of the cube down in the plane. And so this is two-dimensional, but it gives us a way to visualize this three-dimensional object. So we're all familiar with this. Um, I do want to point out that this uh, is uh, a little snippet of a longer video that was made in 1978, and it was uh, by the geometers Tom Banchoff and Charles Strauss. And it was uh, one of the early, or maybe the earliest examples of using um, computers to allow you to visualize things. So an early example of computer graphics. Um, so this is their cube, and this is their project. This is one of their projections of the four-dimensional cube. So this would be uh, sort of rotating a four-dimensional object and looking at the projection down into the plane. So that may not mean too much to you, but it you know. You know, if this projection of the cube makes sense to you, then the four-dimensional cube is sort of the analog one-dimensional higher. So projections are one way. Another way that people like to think about higher dimensions is to imagine slicing them, looking at slices or cross sections of a shape. So in this case, let's, um, let's drop down a dimension. Suppose we didn't live in three-dimensional space. Suppose we just lived in a flat plane. So if we lived in a flat plane and we wanted to visualize something three-dimensional, we could imagine that three-dimensional object passing through our plane. And when it passed through our plane, we could see what that cross-section was. And as that cross-section change, changes, uh, we would have some information about what the, the three-dimensional object looks like. Um, so for example, if we had uh, a ball and it was to pass through the plane, it would be nothing, 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 and then a point would appear, and then a disk, and it would grow, and the disk would shrink, and you get a point, and then nothing again. So this is what it would look like if a three-dimensional ball were to pass through the screen uh, in front of you, right? So that's what it would look like. And you could do exactly the same thing to imagine what a four-dimensional ball would look like if it were to pass through our three-dimensional uh, world. Um, it would begin as nothing, and then a point would show up and then a little solid ball and that solid ball would grow like a three-dimensional ball and then it would shrink again and disappear. So that is what it would look like if a four-dimensional ball were to pass through our three-dimensional uh, existence here, okay? Um, if, we if we're talking about things like cubes, you can imagine the cross sections could look very different. Um, Banchoff and Strauss have a whole bunch of neat examples of uh, cross-sectional slices of cubes. Uh, here's one I particularly like. If it goes from corner to corner, it starts out as a triangle. Uh, at one point in the middle, it's a perfect hexagon, which that's kind of surprising. And then eventually uh, they're triangles again, and then to a point. Uh, and they show a bunch of uh, cross-sections for four-dimensional cubes. I just picked one of them to show you here. Uh, and this one is cool. So the, the whitish, bluish image is the three-dimensional cross-section. And so this one starts out as a triangular pyramid, and it grows, and then the corners of the pyramids cut off. And at one point, it becomes um, an octahedron, and then it disappears again. So that's one example of a cube passing through our three-dimensional space. Um, and I would definitely recommend checking out the full video by Banchoff and Strauss. <clears throat> okay. Another way to think about higher dimensional cubes is to think of generating them from smaller dimensions. So the zero dimensional cube is just a point like this. To get a one dimensional cube, you can imagine moving this zero dimensional cube along a direction and it traces out the one dimensional cube, which is this guy. To get the two-dimensional cube, we're gonna slide this in a perpendicular direction. That's our two-dimensional cube or square. To get our familiar three-dimensional cube, we could slide this in a perpendicular direction. And that would give us what we think of as the cube. 
And by analogy, if we were to, um, if we wanted to describe the four-dimensional cube, we would take our three-dimensional cube and slide it in a direction perpendicular to our three dimensions, which is hard to uh, draw, but this picture is sort of an illustration. The red cube is sort of the before picture. The bl blue cube is the after picture and the yellow lines are, you know, what happens when we slide this in that perpendicular direction. So this is one familiar way of looking at it. Um, many of you have seen that picture. This is the, the same idea here. We start with the big red cube and it's traveling off into the distance and it's getting smaller. And that's this blue cube, uh, which looks like it's sitting on the inside. Um, I should say that common names for this four dimensional cube are the tesseract or, you know, it's the four dimensional hypercube. Um, I did spend a little time on Google and I found this cool um, sculpture. This is in Madrid uh, and this is in honor of their uh, constitution, but this is modeled on the, the hypercube, which I think is kind of beautiful. Okay, <clears throat> and yet one more way of trying to visualize uh, the fourth dimension, we could think about what are the boundaries of these n-dimensional cubes. So if we're starting with a one-dimensional cube, that's just a line segment. Uh, the boundary is just two points, right? These two, uh, you know, these two zero-dimensional points, right? The boundary is always going to be one dimension lower. If we start with the uh, two-dimensional square, the boundary is just the square boundary. And if we wanted to describe this in one dimension, we could cut it and open it up, and then it would sit uh, in one dimension. So if we cut it and unfolded it, we could describe it that way. That's the boundary of the square. For the cube, the three-dimensional cube, um, the boundary is sort of the hollow cube. And you can imagine unfolding that to fit in two dimensions. Uh, this might look like one of your Amazon boxes before you uh, put it in the recycling bin. So this is the unfolded boundary of the three-dimensional cube. And so then the question is, what about the four-dimensional cube? So the boundary consists of a bunch of three-dimensional cubes. So that's already weird, right? Because the dimension is one lower. And if you were to unfold it in a certain way, so that would it fit in three dimensional spaces, here is this beautiful representation of this. So this is the boundary of a four dimensional cube unfolded in three dimensions. Um, and so uh, people on Zoom can't see me pointing at this, but we would kind of want to glue this side and this side together, and this side and this side together, in, which seems impossible to do. But if you lived in a flat plane, you wouldn't imagine how you could glue those two sides together, right? You need a third dimension in order to fold it up. Okay, um, that figure might look familiar to some of you. Uh, I know many dorm room walls have, uh, you know, Salvador Dali artwork on them. And there's this famous uh, piece of his from 1954 that uh, shows the unfolded hypercube. Uh, and I will just to close the circle a little bit, let you know that uh, he did have some contact with Tom Banchoff who did the video. Uh, and I believe that was sort of the inspiration for this uh, this artwork. <clears throat> okay. Uh, okay, so those are some ways to think about the fourth dimension, but let's just think about dimension in general. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of the dimension, then I'm going to put the pause button, and we're going to talk about uh, the public's view of dimension, and then we're going to return to the history of dimension. So um, it's hard to say where to start. I already talked about Aristotle and Euclid. Um, Descartes, the philosopher and mathematician, he did have some things to say about dimension, but it's not exactly, it's not totally relevant to our story, but I thought I would tell you a little bit. Um, Descartes did his work in a time when we were seeing the very beginnings of what we think of as algebra, like algebra that you would learn in ninth grade. Um, and this was a period of transition where geometry reigned, reigned supreme in mathematics and algebra was the up and coming new field um, and so if they saw something like A or A squared or A cubed, they automatically thought of lengths and areas and volumes. And so before Descartes, no one would ever write this algebraic expression. Um, this first part would say that we're adding a line segment and a solid. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, 
And this final term is some four dimensional thing. So that would also not have made any sense to them. Um, they insisted that all of their equations be homogeneous in the sense that everything has the same power. You could add solids together, you could add lengths together, et cetera, but you couldn't mix these up. Um, and so one of Descartes' contributions was to find a, an elegant way around that um, so that you can make sense of an expression uh, like this on the board. So that's another talk for another time, but this had to do with dimension and this was in the early uh, 18th century. <clears throat> okay, now let's move up to the 19th century, the early 19th century. And um, you probably know Mobius from the Mobius band. Um, here, let's do a little thought experiment. Let's say I had that mitten and it was sitting on the table. And let's say that looks like a, a left-handed mitten. So you had a left-handed mitten sitting on the table and you wanted to put it on your right hand. Could you do that with a left-handed mitten? How could you turn a left-handed mitten into a right-handed mitten? I see some of you gesturing, just flip it over, right? So you just flip it over. But to flip it over, you take this two-dimensional shape and you have to flip it over in the third dimension in order to flip it over, which it doesn't seem weird to you at all. Um, but uh, we could ask the same thing about three-dimensional shapes. So here's an example of two knots. They look the same, except that they're mirror images of each other. We can't turn one into the other in three-dimensional space, but if we had access to a fourth dimension, we could flip it over in the fourth dimension uh, to turn one of these into the other. Uh, and Mobius noticed this in 1827, and he wrote, it will be necessary, we must conclude from analogy that we should be able to let one system make half a revolution in a space of four dimensions. But since such a space cannot be thought, so it is also coincidence in this case impossible. So that was the early, uh, early 19th century. Um, but it turned out this was just the beginning. Um, I'm not gonna talk about these mathematicians. You probably know some or all of these names. Um, so there was a lot of action in the 19th century uh, doing things with higher dimensional spaces that would be very familiar to us today, just dealing with them on a mathematical level, not, not trying to think of them physically or anything, just, you know, you could have matrices of any size or vectors of any size or, uh, you know, polytopes of any size, like polyhedra of any size. So all of this was happening in the, um, in the mid 19th century, getting towards the late 19th century. Um, so I know many of you are in my, uh, multivariable class, uh, but I know also that some of you have seen, uh, have been through Math 211. And one thing you know from Math 211 is that Cantor is one of our favorite mathematical spoilers. He came up with all of these really great, uh, controversial, mind-bending observations about mathematics. So just as an example, um, he said that two sets have the same size or cardinality if there's a bijective function between them. So that means like a one-to-one -one correspondence between elements in X and elements in Y. Uh, and that works for finite sets and for infinite sets. And he went on to show that there are different sizes of infinity. And this is often people's you know, favorite mathematical fact from their undergraduate math years. So this is the Cantor that we're talking about. And Cantor, it turns out, had something to say about dimension and I will, give you a little teaser because I'm gonna come back to it, but he made a discovery and he wrote to one of his colleagues about this discovery. I see it, but I do not believe it. So we'll, we'll come back to Cantor and what he had to say about this. Um, so let's take a little detour and let's talk about the fourth dimension in sort of the popular imagination. So the time period I'm mostly focusing on here are, is like, like the 1880s through the 1920s. Um, it turned out that uh, during that time period, the general public was uh, fascinated with the fourth dimension and ideas of a physical fourth dimension. Um, and so also, if we go back to that time period, this was a time period of great scientific progress. And a lot of this progress revolved around things that we couldn't see. So here are just some examples, uh, electromagnetic waves, wireless telegraphy, x-rays, the electron, the atom, radioactivity. Uh, they believed in the ether during that time period. And so all of these esteemed scientists were saying, we know all this information about our world, our universe, and you can't see any of it. And so 
it was sort of in the public public consciousness that uh, that there was more out there that we that was that existed but we couldn't see, and that sort of primed the pump for this belief that there was a fourth dimension. I mean, if we could compute the X-ray of this is actually uh, uh, this is this scientist's wife's hand. You know, if you if you could use an X-ray to see into someone's body, who's to say that there's not really a physical fourth dimension? Right? I mean, that seems totally reasonable. Um, so partly because of that, people are really fascinated with this. Um, some of you may know this book, Flatland. I brought my copy here. It's like 85 pages or something. Um, this famous book from 1884, where there's this world, it is a flat plane, and the characters are like polygons. And uh, there is this three-dimensional world that enters into the story. And it's an analogy for a fourth dimension uh, in addition to our three dimensions. Um, this, was also a, uh, this was also a lampoon of Victorian society at the time, in addition to be, being a math, uh, math story here. Um, in case you are more of a visual person than a reader, uh, this was actually, I was probably made into a movie, into a movie more than one time, but uh, relatively recently, it was a movie with the voices of Martin Sheen and Kristen Bell and some other people. So you could, you could check that out. I assume it's streaming somewhere. Um, so that was 1884. Uh, in 1909, there was, such, uh, there was so much interest in the fourth dimension that Scientific American ran an essay contest, what is the fourth dimension? And they had a $500 prize. I looked on one of these websites that says, you know, how much is this amount of money worth in that day? Uh, and it was around $15,000 prize. Uh, and they ended up compiling some of the responses uh, in a book. Um, I think there were like 450 entries in this competition. Uh, there are also some crazy, really, really interesting characters who um, wrote about, uh, so in addition to Abbott, there were some other people who wrote about the fourth dimension. One of the most interesting is this guy named Charles Howard Hinton. And I could give a whole talk about this crazy character. So he was from Britain. Uh, his father was a polygamist and Charles Hinton, ended up marrying two women and he was discovered and arrested and he ended up fleeing to Japan and then ended up coming to the United States. So that's interesting thing number one. Also interesting is one of his two wives uh, was Mary, Mary Ellen Boole, who is a daughter of George Boole, the you know, famous computer scientist, et cetera. Um, so that was, that, was, that was one of his wives who ended up moving around the world with him. Uh, some other facts that I, there's just all these crazy facts about him. So other things is uh, he invented the pitching machine, the baseball pitching machine when he was at Princeton. It was, it was powered by gunpowder. So that was interesting. Uh, one of his sons invented the jungle gym. And uh, one of his grandsons is Jeffrey Hinton, who is the 2018 Turing Award winner uh, and pioneer of neural networks and deep learning. So who knew? So that's, that's this guy. But he, he wrote extensively on uh, the fourth dimension. Uh, he also wrote some early, what we would call science fiction. Uh, he also, and also in this time period, you know, with this whole belief in things that were not visible to us, often it bled into like the occult and sort of spiritual type matters. Um, and so that was also wrapped up in all of this interest in the fourth dimension. Um, Hinton was the person who coined the term tesseract. Uh, these colored blocks were um, used by him to describe certain ideas in the fourth dimension. He also tesseract kind of caught on. What did not catch on as far as I know is that he thought there should be uh, names to go along with up, down, left, right, and forward and backwards. So in the fourth direction, Anna and Kata were sort of the two directions in that fourth dimension. So that is, that is this one character. Uh, Charles Howard Hinton. Uh, I did want to point out here, he was married to Mary Ellen Boole. Her sister was Alicia Boole Stott. Um, and she actually, uh, although she, she was not the one married to Hinton, um, she uh, was taught mathematics by Hinton. Her father, George Boole, died when she was young. But between Hinton and um, Alicia Boole's mother, they taught her mathematics. And she ended up writing uh, a bunch of works 
regarding higher dimensional spaces. She helped Hinton get some of his books published, et cetera. And so she also is a uh, pioneer in this field of uh, higher dimensional geometry. So that's sort of interesting. Another crazy character that I would like to mention is uh, Claude Bragdon. So I grew up in Rochester, New York. And so I learned about Claude Bragdon that he was a, an architect in Rochester. Um, one, he has a, a bunch of famous buildings. One of them is this railroad station in Rochester. And sadly, this was demolished. Uh, I talked to my parents about it and they remember this train station. Uh, I guess most of it was demolished in the mid sixties. So that was before I was born. And the last bits of it was demolished in the seventies, which I was, which was when I was alive. Uh, but he was a famous architect there. Um, I believe his architecture career kind of ended when he got into some sort of disagreement with George Eastman. So, you know, Kodak is from Rochester. Um, so that was one fact about him. But in addition to being an architect, he was a designer and he did some other things. And he's this uh, great art line drawing artist. And so he drew all these amazing illustrations of the fourth dimension, how to think of the, first dim the fourth dimension. Um, the picture that I had on the cover of my, on the title slide was his, um, and he has all this amazing artwork. Like I said, he was also interested in design. And so he had this idea that you could take projections of four dimensional objects and use those as design objects. So uh, here are some examples. These are uh, from his projective ornament book about how you could use ideas of the fourth dimension to create design. So he was also a very interesting character. Um, in addition to books about the fourth dimension, um, artists also became really fascinated with the fourth dimension. Um, and I think it would be wrong to say, so unlike the, the Dali example, where that was you know, a realistic pic depiction of the four dimensional cube un, you know, opened up, uh, I would say these other famous architects uh, uh, artists were inspired by the fourth dimension. They were all talking about it uh, and so forth. And the existence of a fourth dimension sort of gave them the green light to abandon traditional three-dimensional artwork. Uh, and so these are some, a few of the many examples from this time period. Um, I will say the last several slides here, uh, I, I learned about uh, a lot of this from this really interesting book here uh, this is the fourth dimension and non-Euclidean geometry in modern art. Uh, and the author is L uh, Linda Henderson, who actually might be on this call. So I, I read a lot about this this spring and was just fascinated, fascinated with this material. And sometime over the summer, I had to look something up and I Googled her name and the, the hit that came up was this. And so it turns out that Linda Henderson is a Dickinson alum and she was here on campus like two or three years ago to give a talk, which I had no idea about any of this. Um, and so we've, we've sort of connected here and I was telling her how much I enjoyed reading her, her work. So, uh, so this is uh, Linda Henderson. I would definitely recommend this book if you're interested in how math and art uh, intersect with each other. Um, so here are just a few quotes that I found that just sort of talk about this time period in terms of the art world said the fourth dimension was primarily a symbol of liberation for artists, specifically belief in a fourth dimension encouraged artists to depart from visual reality and to reject completely the one point perspective that for centuries had portrayed the world as three dimensional. Uh, another one talking about Duchamp said, uh, he found out, uh, found something deliciously subversive about the new geometries, the fourth dimension and non-Euclidean geometry with their challenge to so many longstanding truths. So I think it just gave them the green light to just do something totally different. So one of the things you might be thinking about sitting in your seat is, I heard that time was the fourth dimension or isn't time the fourth dimension? So let's address that uh, a little bit. So the answer is yes, it could be the fourth dimension. And this idea goes back uh, at least to the mid 18th century. Um, so Diderot and D'Alembert had this encyclopedia and in the dimensions entry, uh, this is what uh, D'Alembert wrote. He said, I have said that it is not possible to conceive of more than three dimensions. And an intelligent man of my acquaintance believes, however, that one can regard time as a fourth dimension and that the product of time by a solid in this way 
uh, will be a product of four dimensions. This idea, this idea can be disputed, but it seems to me to have some merit, even though it may only be that of a novelty. So this was recognized relatively early. We don't know who his friend was who came up with this idea, but that's interesting. Um, if you know the science fiction uh, novella, uh, The Time Machine by H.G. Wells, in it, the, uh, the inventor of the time machine in the book uh, says the following in the book. So this is a fiction, fictional book. It said, clearly any body must have extensions in four directions. It must have length, breadth, thickness, and duration. There are really four dimensions, three of which we call the three planes of space and a fourth time. There is no difference between time and any of the three dimensions of space, except that our consciousness moves along it. So it was definitely uh, in the air that time was, uh, could be a fourth dimension. Um, Linda Henderson in her work talks extensively about this. And uh, it turns out that really the fourth dimension as space was definitely the dominant idea during this time period. Uh, there were some examples where time was the fourth dimension, but really it was four spatial di dimensions. That was really what Picasso and all those people were imagining. Um, when the public really had the switch from four spatial dimensions to three spatial dimensions and a time dimension, it was because of Einstein and Minkowski uh, with uh, special and general relativity and space time. So Minkowski uh, wrote, for example, henceforth space by itself and time by itself are doomed to fade away in the mere shadows and only a kind of union of the two will preserve independent reality. So uh, this was all starting to happen in the very early 20th century. So you might think, you know, P Picasso and all of those uh, people came after this, maybe they were thinking of time as the fourth dimension. But if you actually go back to this time period, um, Einstein wasn't famous yet. Really, the, the time Einstein became famous was uh, with the so-called Eddington experiment. So this was when um, Arthur Eddington used the solar eclipse to sort of verify some of the predictions of general relativity. And when that happened, that's when Einstein became this household name. And that was really when there was this switch to isn't time the fourth dimension. Uh, and this is what Linda Henderson wrote. She's, she wrote, when the popularity of relativity theory in the 1920s enthroned time as the fourth dimension and Einstein as supreme scientist and, philosopher, scientist and philosopher, both Poincaré and a purely geometric fourth dimension were soon largely forgotten by the public and artists alike. Um, it, did, uh, it did come back a little bit in later, you know, in the uh, more modern times, uh, this spatial four dimension had a, had a resurgence. Um, but at least for a time, time became the fourth dimension. Um, I will point out here that even if you're talking about Minkowski, uh, three dimensions of space and one dimension of time isn't Euclidean space. Uh, it's more complicated than that. So Coxeter, who is a famous geometer, uh, was writing this book about regular polytopes, and he warned the readers about this. He said, little if anything is gained by representing the fourth Euclidean dimension as time. In fact, this idea so attractively developed by H.G. Wells and the time machine has led such authors as John William Dunn into serious misconception of the theory of relativity. Minkowski's geometry of space-time is not Euclidean and consequently has no connection to the present investigation. So all this is to say, we can view time as a fourth dimension, but it's not the fourth dimension. And even if you think of it as the fourth dimension, the physics of it is, is more complicated. Okay, I told you I had a lot to say. So we've talked about uh, we've talked about the beginning of the history. We talked about it in modern culture or in culture of the early 20th century. Uh, now let's return to, to math here. So I promised you a Cantor story. Uh, so Cantor wrote to uh, Dedekind, who's another mathematician, in 1874, and he said, "Can a surface, perhaps a square, including its boundary, put in be put in one-to-one -one correspondence with a line, perhaps a?" straight line segment, including its endpoints, so that to each point of the surface, there corresponds a point of the line, and conversely, to each point of the line, there corresponds a point of the surface. So remember, he was talking about sizes of infinity. He wants to know, is there a one-to-one -one and on-to function between a line segment and a square? 
Um, and he said that a friend had told him that this was absurd since it is obvious that two independent variables cannot be reduced to one, right? So two dimensions and one dimension can't be the same. There can't be such a function. Um, and so just as an example, if we had a line of three dots or a square of nine dots or a cube of 27 dots, those are different numbers of dots, right? So a line, a square and a cube have different cardinalities if you think of them in this crude fashion. Okay, but what Cantor showed is that there does exist a bijective function between a line segment and the square or cubes of any dimension. And uh, he wrote back to Richard Dedekin, I see it, but I don't, don't believe it. So basically he proved it, but he was so stunned by it that he, uh, you know, he couldn't believe it, what he had proven, okay? Um, and so he asked the question, does this, does this mean that there really is no such thing as dimension if these really are the same? So that's a very interesting question. However, um, I can show you exactly what Cantor's function was. Uh, here is the function. Uh, it's highly discontinuous. It goes like that. So that, that is more or less, okay, that's not really the function, but that's the idea. It was a highly, highly discontinuous function. And if you want to think about a coordinate system, you don't want it to be discontinuous. It'd be like, you know, instead of Manhattan having, you know, streets numbered in two, two perpendicular directions, be like assigning addresses at random in Manhattan, right? You would not want to do that for uh, a coordinate system, okay? However, uh, a little while later, uh, Piano discovered what's called a space filling curve. So he found a one-to-one, -one, or sorry, he found a continuous function from the line segment to the square. And uh, if you haven't seen this, it is pretty cool. So you could start out by mapping your line segment in that little uh, squiggly pattern, and then turning some of those squiggles into more squiggles and doing it again and doing it again. And in the limit, if we continued in the limit, you would get a continuous function from the line segment to the full square. So that gets rid of Cantor's problem of, uh, discontinuities, but this introduces a new problem. And this is in the limit, this function is not one-to-one -one anymore. So again, going back to the Manhattan example, it's like giving addresses in Manhattan, but every house had infinitely many addresses. You know, that, that, would, not be, that would not be a good way of uh, assigning addresses. So all of this is uh, making us a little nervous about dimension, but none of it says that dimension doesn't mean anything. And so uh, Cantor wanted to save this idea of dimension. Um, and in the next few decades, there were proofs and people you know, had doubts about these proofs. And it was not clear whether dimension was a real thing or whether dimension was not a real thing. Um, and this finally was resolved uh, in 1912 um, by a mathematician named Brouwer. And I'm looking at the time here. Maybe I won't say too much about this, but Brouwer proved what's called the invariance of dimension theorem, that if Rn and Rm, so this is n-dimensional space and m-dimensional space, are not, uh, that they are not topologically the same when n is different from m. So he was able to prove that there really is something different about the real number line versus the plane versus three-dimensional space versus four-dimensional space. Um, and I think I will, because I, we're running a little late on time here, but I won't say too much about this. Um, but he gave, he gave a clever function that mapped three-dimensional space into three-dimensional space. And this, under the assumption that dimension really did, uh, that two-dimensional space and three-dimensional space were really the same. And he got a contradiction from that. But I think I will skip that just for time's sake. So that was 1912. We still haven't really talked about what the definition of dimension is, right? That's how we started this conversation. So also during this time period, the early 20th century, mathematicians were proposing various definitions for dimension. And the way this works is that, you know, we might have four or five different definitions of dimension. They might all be different, but maybe they, they give you the same number for a plane and they give you the same number for a cube and, and so forth. And the times when they differ might be these really exotic spaces, exotic objects. So here are just some examples of uh, definitions. So one is called the Lebesgue covering dimension. 
So if we had something one dimensional like this circle, we could cover it with some sets like this. And what you'll see is that some of the circle is covered just by one set and some of the circle is covered by two sets. And if you arrange things right here, and I'm sweeping a bunch under the rug, if you arrange things right, that's the worst it's gonna be, that you'll have two sets overlapping. So a one dimensional space has at most two sets overlapping. If we have something two dimensional like this square and we put these overlapping things, you'll see regions that are covered by one set, regions that are covered by two sets and regions that are covered by three sets. And if you're careful, you can arrange it so that that's the worst, that you, you have three sets overlapping. And so that number is one larger than the dimension. So that's the Lebesgue covering dimension. Um, there were several examples that you might call inductively defined. So this is based on the fact that the boundary of something one dimensional is zero dimensional. The boundary of something two dimensional is one dimensional. The boundary of something three dimensional is two dimensional. So it could be defined inductively in that kind of way. So that's another type of definition. Uh, and then this last one is an interesting one I wanna spend a little more time on. Um, this one, we're gonna define dimension in the following way. This is uh, Hausdorff's dimension. So let's take our shape that we wanna figure out what dimension it is, and we're gonna expand it by some factor. And then we wanna see how many copies of the original shape we get. So in this example, let's explode everything by a factor of three. So if we expand a point by a factor of three, we just get a point. If we expand a line segment by a factor of three, we get three line segments. If we expand a square by a factor of three, we get nine squares. If we expand a cube by a factor of three, we get 27 cubes. And we can see those numbers down there, really that's three to the zero, three to the first, three squared and three cubed. And that exponent captures the dimension information. So that was sort of the basis behind the Hausdorff dimension. So if we expand it by a factor of K and we get K to the D copies of our original, then the dimension is D. So that's kind of cool. Nice uh, visual way of thinking about this. One interesting thing is it allows us to produce non-integer dimensions. So uh, one place where this was recognized, or the earliest place this was really recognized was in this article by Mandelbrot, uh, we asked how long is the coastline of how long is the coast of Britain, and there's this observation that if you use smaller and smaller rulers, then because of all the indentations, the measured length is going to get longer and longer. Um, so Lewis Fry Richardson had already observed this, and he talked about what this relationship was, and Mandelbrot recognized that really this was the Hausdorff dimension in disguise, and that this could be applied to what he called fractals which we now know a lot about fractals. So here's the famous Mandelbrot set. Okay, so let's see how this would work for a fractal. Uh, let's look at the, the Koch snowflake. So the way we make, or I guess the Koch curve. So we'll start off with a line segment and then we remove the middle third of the line segment and attach a little triangle of the same length as the removed side. And then do that for each of the remaining sides. So we're gonna do this and then we do it again and we do it again, and we do it again, and we do this infinitely, and that's gonna give us this infinitely wiggly curve, okay? So let's try to figure out what the dimension of this curve is using the Hausdorff dimension idea. So we wanna expand it by some factor. Let's say we expand it by a factor of three. So that gives us this one. So we explode it by a factor of three. And if you look closely, what you'll see is that there's one copy, there's another, there's another, and there's another. So there are four copies of the original curve sitting inside this exploded one. So remember how this works. We take three to the D and set that equal to the number of copies. So three to the D equals four, and D is the dimension. We could take the natural law or the logarithm of both sides, uh, and we end up with 1.26 as the dimension of this thing. So it's somewhere between a line and a plane. You know, something between one and two dimensional, but closer to one than to two. So this is this idea. Um, and if you wanna play around with it, you could do something very similar for these other fractals and you can compute the fractal dimensions of, uh, of these um, famous fractals. <clears throat> okay. Uh, 
Okay, so my last topic. So I just, this is a whirlwind of the kinds of things that you might encounter with dimension. The last one brings us really close to the present day. So we wanna think about high dimensional spaces. So the reason this is relevant today is in this age of quote unquote big data, you know, people and organizations and governments are collecting huge amounts of data on people. And you could think of that as uh, a high dimensional space. If we had, you know, if we had a whole spreadsheet of information about you, that is a point in a very high dimensional space. So um, statisticians and data scientists uh, are regularly working in these very high dimensional spaces. Um, and naively, you might think the more information, the better, right? The more information, the better. However, it turns out that the geometry and therefore the math and statistics of high dimensional spaces is really weird and troubling. Um, and this applied mathematician named Richard Bellman famously referred to this as the curse of dimensionality. Things get weird when you get into these high dimensional spaces. So let's talk a little bit about that. Some of the weird things. Oh, back to Tom Banchoff. He said, all of us are slaves to the prejudices of our own dimension. So we're familiar with zero, one, two, and three dimensions. And maybe our intuition might help us a little bit with four, but it's not gonna help us at all with a thousand dimensional spaces. Okay, so here's one example of a weird thing that can happen. This is a one dimensional, uh, cube, a one dimensional cube, a two dimensional cube, a three dimensional cube. These all have length, area, volume. Uh, area or volume one. But the question is how far apart are objects in here? So for the first one, you can be at most one unit away from another point. In the square, you can be at most square root of two units away from another point. In the cube, you could be at most the square root of three units away from another point. And in n dimensional space, you could be at most uh, n square root of n units away from another point. So even though you're in this tiny volume, this volume of, of size one, you can have points that are really, really far away if you're in a high dimensional space. And when you're trying to do statistics or data analysis, that means things are far apart. You have to collect huge number, probably unrealistic amount of data to make any conclusions. Things don't cluster well, things like that, okay? Um, and so that's one example. Uh, here's another example. Let's ask the question, if we choose a point at random inside an n-dimensional cube, what's the probability that, it'll, that it will be within 0 0.005 units of the boundary? Okay, so on this first example, uh, you could, your, uh, your chance of being in that blue region is 0 0.005 plus 0 0.005. So there's a 1% chance that you're gonna be near the boundary. For the second one, there's a 0.99 squared percent chance that you'll be in the red. So there's one minus that for the blue. So about 2% chance. This one, it's one minus 0.99 cubed. So it's about 3% chance. But I think you can see where this is going. If you're in an n-dimensional cube, that is the probability that you'll be within um, 0 0.005 of the boundary. And so if you were in a thousand dimensional space, the chance of being near the boundary is 99.996%. So you're almost certainly gonna be near the boundary if you're in one of these high dimensional spaces. So there's this quote that I came across, which I love, which says, high dimensional bread is almost all crust. So that's just, again, bizarre. I know we're just about out of time. This is my last example here. Uh, here's one more weird example. Suppose you had a two by two uh, cube in n-dimensional space and you put balls of radius one in all of the corners. Then in that cavity in the middle, you put an additional ball. So I've shown dimensions two and three. Then the question is how big is that central ball? This first one, you can work out the math. It's not too hard. The radius is square root of two minus one. This one, the, the radius is the square root of three minus one. And in general, if you're in n dimensions, the radius is the square root of n minus one. Okay, so that's interesting. But remember, this is a two by two by two by two by two cube. And so when you're in dimension nine, the radius of that inner ball is two. And so you're already, that inner ball is already tangent to the sides of the box. And once you get above that, the, that inner ball is sticking out outside of the box which 
my mind can just not visualize at all. Um, so this is just a cautionary tale about high dimensional spaces and how dimension can get weird in these high dimensional spaces. And it looks like we're uh, out of time here. So I should probably end it. Like I said, if you wanna read a little bit about it, uh, I did have this article in the Quantum Magazine, which you could Google if you would like to read it a little bit more slowly. Uh, but I think that's probably a good place to quit. Thanks.